Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. I want to talk about uh, the journey of generosity and how awesome and generous God is to us. And before I do that, though, there are some people in this room who have been generous with their lives. Because this Wednesday, we celebrate Veterans Day. And I want to I thank those who gave time, energy, family sacrifices, everything to serve our country. So if you have served our country and you're a veteran in this room today, would you stand so we could just thank you as well and honor your service to our country. Go ahead and stand on up. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. We appreciate you. Thank you for your generosity with your life. I, I understand that whenever we talk about money in church, it could be a sore subject for some people because of different experiences they've had in churches. And so I just want you to be aware that, um, that my heart and attitude today is this. I believe everyone wants to be generous in their giving. I think we all want to be generous in our giving. It's just sometimes we need a little heart work to get us to that place. And I think there has been times where uh, pastors and churches look like they're very money hungry, and I'm sorry you've experienced that. And I hope that that's not the attitude you get from my heart in this series. I know that we're in a series, or we're in a season right now of generosity. It's Thanksgiving coming up, praise God for that. It's Christmas. But can I tell you, sometimes this season is some of the most wasteful spending that we've ever had in our lives. Am I right? And then next thing you know, in January, you're bogged down by a bunch of credit card debt. So I I'm, I'm just want to make sure that you have a healthy financial life to help you not be stressed out by your debt. Who, who likes debt in this room? Don't raise your hand. My goodness. No one likes it. I don't like it. I was blessed to live and be around a generous family. I watched my parents as pastors not only tithe and give to the church, but they gave to families in need across Delaware and in our church. Every Christmas, it was like it was time to wrap gifts for another family. And then they would do things throughout the whole year secretly. And as a kid, I'm thinking, where is this secret stash of money they have? How do they keep having this money? And it was just amazing to see. I grew up around that. Later on, I would get married and find out my wife's parents are very generous too. And what a blessing to be around them and their generosity. But something recently happened uh, that really spoke to me and reminded me of my own testimony. Uh, my daughter, uh, Pastor John, has been trying to teach the kids to give. And parents, I want to encourage you to let kids be part of your giving to God. And so uh, Pastor John made these, they got these little boxes and they had the kids decorate them. And so they're going to put offering in it and bring it in the next week. And so my daughter shows me on Saturday, uh, a couple Saturdays ago, what she wants to bring into church. Now, just so you know, we, we teach our kids to have three jars. Uh, we have three mason jars, a giving jar, a saving jar, and a spending jar. It's kind of funny because my daughter's spending jar tends to be more full than the giving or saving jar. So I didn't expect what was going to come next because my son, my son's a big saver. My son wants to buy a car. And I'm like, sounds good. Keep saving that money up because I ain't buying it. I don't want to buy it. Rather, you earn it. The, the discipline to get there and buy it, right? So he's got a bunch of money in his savings. He's got some money in his giving and he's got like nothing in his spending. I'm cool with that. Sounds good. My daughter, everything's in the spending. A little bit in the savings, just a little bit. Well, she shows me this container and, and it's full of money. The, the box for kids church. And I'm like, well, how much are you giving to, to kids ministry? She said, all of it. I'll go to the closet. I look in there. All of her jars are empty. I said, Pure, uh, obviously, we have not taught you what savings means. Let me teach you what savings means. She's like, no, no, no. I want to give the whole thing. She was very, if you know my daughter, she's strong-willed. Give everything. She's given everything. If she has decided, it's to give everything. 
there was a lot of money in there. Birthdays, you know, Christmas gift stuff, little grandma, grandpa, aunt, you know, uncle giving. And I said, okay. And it, and it cracked me up. She's eight years old. When I was eight years old, God put it on my heart. I had a, anyone used to, anyone still drink Crystal Light tea? We finished that Crystal Light tea. I cut a hole in the top and I put all my quarters and all my coins and all my dollars. I squeeze them in there, right? When I was eight years old, Pastor John tricked me to give. No, joking, no, no. <laughs> Pastor John had this special offering and I'm at home and I felt like God was saying, bring your offering in. It wasn't like he audibly said it. It was just in my heart, give it all up. So I brought it in and I gave it and I was so happy to give. And when I saw my daughter doing this, I couldn't say no because I had the same thing happen to me. And I wanted my daughter to follow through and to be that generous giver that she wanted to be in that moment. And again, I believe that most Christians want to be generous. I have found that we want to give and experience the joy of being generous in our giving to church or in those in need and those, our neighbors and people around us. But sometimes we need biblical guidance on how to live a generous life. And so my goal is not to make you feel bad about your current giving or anything. My goal is to help you see where a generous life actually comes from. Because here's the thing, too often you feel guilted to give, coerced to give, a setup's coming, he's gonna ask for money. What if we wanna give because it's in our heart to just give? Because the spirit of generosity is in us through God. So where does generosity come from? It actually comes from God, not us. God is very generous. We're going to look at Genesis 1. We're going to look at some other scriptures today. We're going to go through a, quite a few scriptures. I didn't want to make my tech team put all these scriptures on the screen. So they are on the article I post um, after the sermon on our website, calvarydover.org. You can go to, to click on grow and you'll see the, the after the sermon message with my notes on it. But where does the generosity come from? It comes from God. And Genesis 1 is where it all begins. Genesis 1, verse 6, it says, Then God said, let us make human beings in our image. That's the Trinity there. Notice the plural, us and our, to be like us. So Jesus, the Holy Spirit, was God, and God was there. He said, let us make human beings in our image. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, and all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground that none of us like. Why did he make snakes? So God, and mosquitoes, and spiders, let's keep going. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Then God said, look, I have given you every seed-bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food. And I have given every green plant as food for all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. Everything that has life, and, and that is what happened. Then God looked down or looked over all he had made, and he saw that it was very good. What we see here is, is God gave you life, gave me life. Did any of you guys create yourself? Raise your hand. Nope, because you're not the creator. He gave you breath so you could breathe. He gave us land so we could govern it. So we have God who was very generous and gave us everything we need. And then he said what? To steward it. To be good stewards of what I have given you. Because it all belongs to God. Everything he's given us belongs to God. Belongs to him. And he's saying, govern it, reign over it, steward it. Be good stewards of it. I just want to thank God for giving life. Thank you, God, for giving me breath. He even gave us companionship in Genesis. Thank God for that. Thank God for friends and family. But then the fall happened. And this awesome flow of generosity and appreciation and gratitude for that generosity was damaged by sin. And God had to wipe out the entire earth with a flood and he had to restart and make sure Noah understood 
And this is what Genesis 9, 3 says, everything that lives and moves about will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, now I give you everything. So we jacked it up because of sin. And God goes, all right, you can have it again. Let's try this again. Interesting, isn't it? See, I believe that our generosity is hindered by sin. And I'll talk more about that next week because I have some awesome things to share with you to help you gain freedom to live that generous life that you want to live. But let's go to Genesis 22. And this is a really interesting story. It's kind of scary and weird at the same time because what God asked Abraham to do, just know that this is a test. This is a test. But it, talks, it, it shows us God's generosity to Abraham. Okay? And Abraham would be the person where we would all come from. All right? Like all of his people, all God's people would come from Abraham. It would be a nation that he would use to reach the world. Genesis 22, 1 says, sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, here I am. Verse 2 says, take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. Um, if that was me, I'd be wondering if the reception's working well in my ears. Because... Isaac was Abraham's only son that they cried about for years and prayed about for years, he and Sarah, and they wanted this son, and God's saying, give him up to me. Give him back to me, really, because he gave him his son. The next morning, Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him, along with his son Isaac. Then he chopped wood for a fire for a burnt offering and set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told his servants. The boy and I will travel a little farther. We will worship there. And notice what he says here. Because he's supposed to sacrifice his son. He says, we will worship there. And then we will come right back. It's interesting that he uses the plural, like Isaac's going to come back. I always wondered if that's perhaps Abraham's faith already in, in operating. So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders. It's kind of messed up. While he himself carried the fire and the knife, as the two of them walked on together, Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father, yes, my son, we had the fire and the wood, the boy said, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? So he's kind of figuring things out. God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son, Abraham answered, and they both walked on together. That's faith that God will provide. When they arrived at the place where God had told him to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Again, this is a test. Do not do this. This was then. Not now. And Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. At that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, thank God. Yes, Abraham replied, here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way, for now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. That was Abraham's heart. That's a picture of Abraham's heart. He was everything to him. And God was like, can you give up your heart for me? Yes. We don't know if Abraham idolized his son, but it could be that God just corrected Abraham's worship to make sure it worshiped him and him alone. Wow. Wow. Then Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in a thicket. So he took the ram and sacrificed it as his burnt offering in place of his son. Abraham named the place Yahweh, Yaira, or Jehovah, Jaira, which means the Lord will provide. To this day, people still use that name as, as a proverb. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. The first time you see God's name as Jehovah, Jaira is right here in the story. It had nothing to do with money. 
It had to do with a sacrifice. You know what's interesting? If we step out in faith, God will provide the sacrifice. But he wants us to give our whole heart to him. We are, Romans 12, 1, we are the living sacrifice. Amen? At this time, the only thing Abraham could do to prove that is to give up his son. God stopped him and God provided a ram in the thicket. Now, here's what happens next. Because God is so generous, it's, it's ridiculous. It's radical generosity. He goes on to say this. This is what the Lord says. Because you have obeyed me and have not withheld even your son, your only son, I swear by my own name that I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond number. Like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore, your descendants will conquer the cities of their enemies and through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. All because you have obeyed me. Thank God for Abraham's faith. We are blessed because of it. Wow. God will take your sacrifice, your generosity, and he will exponentially multiply it. He can do much more with what you give him than you can with what you have. Praise God for his generous, you know what this was? This was generous love. Generous mercy and grace poured out for us. And what's beautiful about this scripture is it's a picture of Jesus. Did we know that? Isn't this cool? Jesus is the lamb of God, the scriptures say. It should have been us on that altar, but instead God provided a ram in the thicket. It should have been us on the cross. Instead, God gave us Jesus. God is so generous. He, what's amazing is, is in this time, God knew that we would need eternal life. And he's already blessing us here on this life, but he's like, I'm gonna give you eternal life through Jesus Christ. God is amazing. You wanna enjoy this life? Okay, here's what I'm gonna give you. Be good stewards of it. But I got more for you. It's called eternal life. There's no value you can place on eternal life. Eternal life is richness, the epitome of being rich because you get to live and actually enjoy everything you have forever. And if we think we're blessed here, wait till we get to heaven where the streets are gold. We wear gold. We'll be walking on gold. Everything under my feet is dirty. That's how different heaven's gonna be. Eternity is gonna be. Wow, the obedience of Abraham, but then the obedience of Jesus to be generous with his own life and say, I lay down my life. Wow, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Church, I'm encouraged by this. Love gives, period. When we love God, out of that love, we will be generous in giving to whoever needs it. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And if we think that that's, that's not enough, then we, we, got some, we got some struggles there. But listen to this. Here now, Romans 8, 32, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how Will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? He already gave us his son. He's already offering eternal life for all those who believe. And while you're here on earth waiting for that moment, I'll give you all things you need. And that's interesting because that's what God put on my heart to read in Matthew 6 today. To not worry about anything as we seek first his kingdom. When I read these scriptures, though, of Jesus' life, there's a principle of generosity I see here that convicts me. The generosity God demonstrated for us was sacrificial, not comfortable. And I want to give God my entire life, even if it means I'll be uncomfortable. That's the kind of, that's the kind of following of God. He's calling us. Jesus says to lay down your life for me. 
take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. God's looking for your entire life, your entire heart, not just your money. You think he needs our money? He'll use it. He wants your whole heart. He want, you know what? Because it all belongs to him anyway. He graciously gave it. And he can do so much with the little we give, but he's, he is generous God. And so how do we become generous? That's so important we understand this. How do we become generous? Maybe we struggle to be generous. And again, it's not something that you should have to work up to be generous. It's not something that you should have to strive to be. It should be a natural reflex and flow of the body of Christ. Amen? Here's what I mean. If we live by the law, we'll, we'll give because we have to. But if we live by and because of the grace of Jesus Christ, we will give because we want to. If we live by the law, it's like trying to push a car with no gas in it, in neutral, up a hill. It ain't going anywhere. I tried it. And my back still hurts because of it. Up my driveway so I can get close enough to my other car to jump it. And it wasn't moving. But... If Jesus changes us, if Jesus gets a hold of our hearts, Jesus changes everything. We sang it today. If Jesus changes, it's like putting batteries in a flashlight so it could actually work. It's like putting gas in a car so it could actually move. You won't have to even think about being generous. You just will be generous. Why? Because when Jesus is in you, you become more like him. And Jesus gave his all. So that Calvary, Calvary doesn't want you to be generous and like, we don't want you to, to make yourself be generous. We don't want it to be grudgingly. We want it to be cheerfully and willingly. Why? Because the gospel, Jesus Christ does that for you. It's better that you give willingly and cheerfully than give begrudgingly. Because it will be the overflow of God's generosity to you, your appreciation, your gratitude for what Jesus did in your life. It's evident in Acts chapter two and chapter four. The church exploded and they started selling everything. They started selling their, their land and, and extra homes and property, bringing it to the leaders, the apostles of the church at that time so they could distribute it to help the ministry and help those in need. And praise God that Calvary has an amazing benevolent ministry to take care of needs in this church and in this community. And by the way, if you didn't know it, Calvary has a benevolent ministry for us, us church people too. If you're in trouble, the reason why we give is to help our own church people get through storms in life too. I don't know if we, if we realize that. We help people sitting around you all the time in these pews that need help. And then we help the people in our community because we're missional. Like we learned last week, Calvary is a missionary church. That's why we give. They had people doing so, the generosity was insane and it was a reflex to help everyone in need. And the Bible says that there was no needs in the family of God. Let's go, for, let's go back into scripture though. Generosity in the gospels. One of my favorite stories is the feeding of the 5,000. Anyone like that story? This, this boy, there's, there's, a, there's crowds, more than 5,000 people. And it says feeding 5,000 men. So women and children is not included in that. And there's a boy who has five loaves of bread and two fish. And they're wondering, how are we going to feed all these people, Jesus? And the generosity of a little boy comes forward to bring it. Jesus prays over it and all of them eat. And there was so much fruit, food left over. There was 12 basketfuls of food left over. God, wow. It's like God shows off sometimes just for fun. Uh, you barely have any food? How about you have leftovers afterwards? How about an overflow? Why? Because God never runs out of supply. He's eternal. That's the God we serve. A generous God. I want to tell you a personal story that speaks volumes to this. In 2016, God put on my heart to move 
out of our house that we were living in for 10 years for a variety of reasons, and one of them being the safety of my kids. I was on the road walking. I, I didn't live in a neighborhood at the time. In 2016, for 10 years, we lived on a, on a side street, and cars would fly down the street. I'd be walking or running, um, and when I say running, more like dying, trying to run. Um, I would be walking, and I would see cars come by me, and men and women texting and swerving almost hitting me. And I would yell, hey, look out. I didn't want to die. I'm jumping in the ditch twice. Well, my kids want to ride their bikes, and they're just in the driveway going in circles. I just, God was just putting in my heart to go. So I started praying. And it was in October of 2016 that we started the process, put our house on the market. It took a while, actually, to sell our house. In that time, we were sure we could get a USDA quali uh, qualify for a USDA loan. From the point of that to the point we actually got to sell our house, my wife took on a little extra work, just about $1,500 extra to do lunches for CCA, for Calvary Christian Academy School. And so she would manage the lunchroom, and CCA was generous to give, us, give her a little bit more money to do that because she lost her planning period for an hour and a half to almost two hours. So they gave her another $1,500 or so to do that. It was hourly. Well, guess what? We come to find out that the USDA loan has a limit on how much you can make. And we went right over that amount, about $1,000 or less. So we didn't qualify for a fully financed loan. So now we have to come to the table to buy a house. We have to bring money to the table. We couldn't afford that. The reason why is our house wasn't appraised for how much we bought it. The reason why is because we bought it in 2008, 2009 at the recession. We bought the house six months later, the recession hit, we lost about thirty-five to $40,000 in value in our home. We lived 10 years in that home and it was like paying rent in an apartment. Fast forward to the time when we actually sold the house, we made $800 in equity. So it was like getting our deposit back for an apartment. But it was a house, it was a ranch, it was a, it was a great home. But we knew that God wanted us to entertain in our home, have community groups. God gave me this vision to be spreading out into our community and our homes and having Bible studies. And I knew we needed more space to have so many people in our house and have their kids run around. And I wanted the safety for my children. So God planned this desire in my heart to move. We, we pushed forward and we pursued. When we found out that night that we couldn't afford to go with that loan and that we would have to go with a conventional FHA loan, we would need thousands of dollars to make it. We didn't have it. That night, our dreams were crushed, and there was tears at the dinner table. And my son saw us crying. He disappeared. Well, where'd he go? He came back running with his piggy bank. And he said, I want you guys to have this for the house. He's eight years old. Seven to eight. Actually, no, he's seven at that time. Cute little response. I want you to have this money. So what did I do? I actually opened it and we started counting it because I wanted to honor my son's sacrifice, his generosity. I said, thank you, buddy. We will take that. I wanted him to learn this lesson. We will take that and we will apply. It was about $6 in some sense, if I can remember. I kid you not. Moments later, front door, there's a couple at our front door, I'll, I'll leave them nameless. They came and they offered the amount of money we needed for a down payment on our house. God saw our struggle with the recession and with the house. He didn't ignore us. He knows about the sparrows. Maybe that scripture was for me today, just to remind me. So here's the thing. In 2016, or actually sooner than that, I'm sorry, earlier than that, when things were really tight because of the recession, we were encouraged to default our loan so we could get help because we couldn't get help because we were paying our loan. We were so tight that our cars were falling apart. And I was a youth pastor here. Our cars are, cars are falling apart and... There were times where I had to borrow my wife's car to get to work, vice versa. And we were so tight that we were told to default our loan, go bankrupt, 
so that you can get help from the government. Because our loan was not a Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac loan. And something in my wife rose up and said, don't do that. That's not honoring God to do that. Our situation, it wasn't honoring God. If we have the means, we should pay the loan, even though I can't stand paying debt. So we did. Come to find out years later, guess what? To be a lead pastor at Calvary Church, you guys ran a credit check on me. (laughs) With an 800 plus credit score, I got past that part as a lead pastor. Ready? But here's the thing. The Assemblies of God does not allow pastors to lead churches if they've bankrupt or defaulted in those ways. Because you, we have to know how to manage our money in order to run a church. My wife was looking out for us. Oh, the story's not over. It was bad. There were so many scary things that happened. But we sold the house, cash, $800 equity, Oh, I used that $800 to get the, get, the, get the other house ready. Thank God. Oh, here's the, here's the beautiful thing. I'm going to take more time on this one. You guys okay if we hang out just a little longer? This is why God is so good. Our house wouldn't sell for five months, five, six months. Couldn't believe it. We repainted everything. It's gorgeous. Nice little ranch, nice wood floors, everything looked good. Couldn't sell it. We didn't know why. We go into another neighborhood, accidentally find a house that we fell in love with. We couldn't afford it. We get a call from our realtor the same day going, hey, guess what? I think you can't afford it. They dropped the price 10 grand. I'm like, okay. Come to find out it's a brand new home, exact layout we're looking for when we went in there. Sidewalks for our kids to ride their bikes, a neighborhood, all that good stuff. Praise God. But here's the thing. They forgot to put the house on MLS. That's the reason why it wasn't selling. It wasn't in the network for homes to be sold. No one, they, the builders couldn't understand why it wouldn't sell. It was a gorgeous house. Why not? Why isn't it selling? Drop the price 10 grand. Guess how long it's been there? Five to six months. See, God was saving it for us. And then he dropped the price 10 grand. But wait, there's more. No. I just want, I'm sharing this story to encourage you because we remain faithful to God and being generous all those years. Man, was it hard sometimes. Man, was it hard to help a family in need when you knew that you needed to replace your brakes in your car so you don't die. Which, by the way, I'm not that irresponsible. I got them done. So... And God, by the way, doesn't want you to be in debt to be generous with people. Just so you know, God does not want you to be in debt. He doesn't want you to live in debt so you can help everyone else. I don't believe in the poverty gospel that you sell everything and then you don't have anything. Now you need help. That's actually not what scripture teaches. So God's called us to be good stewards of our finances. So here's the thing. We lost about thirty-five dollars to $40,000 on the value of that house. Fast forward to our new house, COVID 2020 hits. Everyone, it's bad, it's a bad year, right? It's also a good year. Because the interest rate dropped. We were, we were uh, our house was 4.25 interest rate. It dropped to 2.85. I called up my, my agent. I said, hey, I think it's time to refinance. She said, yes, it is. I waited for two weeks. She probably thought I was crazy. God told me to wait. Because she was offering me 3.25, I waited, and all of a sudden, she's like, um, I think I know why you waited. It's down to 2.85 now. So I waited, right? Here's the thing. We get the loan. We're paying less for our house now than we did in our other house for 10 years. God, um, oh, I'm, I'm jumping ahead. I'm sorry. I'm losing my track here. Here's what's crazy. That we bought the house in 2017. It's time now to refinance, okay, in 2020. That's where I'm at. We refinance. Guess how much my house appraised for? The same amount I lost on my old house. That, that much more. That amount I lost was added to the appraisal of my house. 
So $35,000. We were living in our house from 2017. We're still in it. 2020, the, the value of my house jumped $35,000 where I live. God gave me back because he saw he saw the faithfulness of his people. He will see your faithfulness and he will give it back. And he gave us all that. But that's not it. We were living in a 30-year loan. When we refinance, we're now in a 20-year loan. Shaved off the 10 years we lost, paying less a month. And God gave us back the value that we lost from their old house. That is God. That's God. Because a little boy said, here, take my $6 in some sense. Because that night, I went back into my room and <laughs> back into my TV room almost in tears because I knew that we were going to be stuck in this house for a really long time and it wouldn't be safe. And I'm back in that room and God says, remember John 6 when I multiplied the boy's gift? And God used someone else. God put it on someone else's heart to give. So when God puts on your heart to give, don't disobey. Because someone else's, God was speaking to someone else. And God showed up that night and fulfilled that faith that my son had. And God provided for us. And now we're using our home exactly the way we want it. To reach our neighbors, to reach Delaware. Praise God. Luke 21, Luke chapter 21, one through four. There's so much generosity in the Bible, it's not even funny. But this story gets me every time. Luke chapter 21, one through four. Because I think, well, I'll say it after I read this. While Jesus was in the temple, he watched the rich people dropping their gifts in the collection box. Then a poor widow came by and dropped in two small coins. I tell you the truth, Jesus said, this poor widow has given more than all the rest of them. For they have given a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything she has. In other words, what she could give, she gave. You don't have to have a lot to be generous. God knows what you have. God knows what you make. God is asking you to give what you can, what you have set to do. Generosity isn't giving out of abundance. It's giving out of gratitude for what God has given us. Generosity. Here's a question to think about. Is it measured by the amount or by the sacrifice? See, in this story and in every story of the Bible, it's not so much about the amount. It's about your heart and the sacrifice. Why? Because Jesus sacrificed his life. God wants more than what we give him. He wants our whole life. The beauty of this passage is Jesus' enthusiasm to point out the woman's generosity. Praise God. Praise God. True generosity doesn't come from our excess. It comes from sacrificial hearts. So in other words, what I was told a long time ago is don't wait till you're rich to be generous. Be generous now. Be generous now and it works. I'm gonna, I'm gonna close with this and I keep saying that in other services and I'm sorry. I promise we'll close with this last paragraph I have. Luke 19 I'm going to just tell you the story. Zacchaeus was a tax collector. He was a thief. He took more money than he should. It wasn't right what he was doing. And he heard about Jesus and he said, I got to see this guy. He was, he was short. And so he's climbing a tree to see Jesus. And Jesus, said, Jesus sees him and he says, I'm going to come to your house and eat. So Jesus invites himself over. He sees this guy's excitement to see him. He's like, I'm coming to your house to eat. So something happens in this house because here's what happens. Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor. And if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Because he was, he was a thief. He was cheating people on their taxes. 
And so now he hangs out with Jesus and we don't have all the fill in the blanks, but he was hanging out with Jesus and something happened there because Jesus says this, and he wasn't, this is the thing, is Zacchaeus wasn't showing off what he's going to do. Something happened in his heart. Because Jesus says this, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. Oh, interesting. Interesting. What did we read about Abraham in Genesis 22? The generosity just keeps flowing. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Zacchaeus was saved. His broken heart that caused him not to be generous was healed. It was changed. And now generosity started flowing. Jesus didn't ask for an offering. Jesus just changed his heart. Zacchaeus willingly gave an offering and made things right with the people he cheated. You see, no one should beg you for money. No leader should ask or beg you for money in a begging way because God will put it in your heart to give anyway. Because God lives in us through his spirit. Jesus comes into us. The gospel changes our hearts so that we give because of what Christ has done in us. When Jesus lives in us, Jesus comes out of us. Not just generosity, but love, kindness, holiness, purity, all the characteristics of Christ, patience, kindness, all of that. The joy, the peace. When you are saved by Jesus Christ, everything flows the way it's supposed to flow right from your heart to your hands to your feet, everything. Our generosity, see, Zacchaeus' generosity was a response to Jesus' generosity to him. When we are generous, our lives reflect the heart of God. Every act of generosity that you offer someone ultimately points them to God's generosity. So here's the thing, you want to be generous. I know that. Every time I talk to people, every time I'm helping people with this topic, their heart is, I want to be generous. Sometimes you just need a little extra work on your heart. Amen. But Jesus was generous to us. And thank you, God, that he was willing to lay down his life and give it all for us. Can we pray together? Next week, I'm really excited to share with you another piece of this generosity, how God sets you free from things in this world to be a generous life, to live a generous life. God, we thank you for your generosity. And we learn today that generosity flows from you and from our hearts into this world. Why? To point people to you, to do your work and your ministry. So God, we learn the foundation today that you don't make us give. We give from our hearts. God, we are generous because what you did for us. Your generosity inspires our generosity. We thank you, God, for that. Lord, I pray if there's anyone in this room who has not given their lives to Jesus, or if they have not accepted your generous love for them, their, your generous grace and mercy, that they would put their trust in Jesus today and say, God, thank you for forgiving me of all my sins. Thank you for saving me from hell and death and giving me eternal life. I accept your son, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. And now I will live for you. If you pray that prayer, let us know. We want to help you with that journey. We want to even confirm that decision in your heart. Thank you, everyone. Let me pray. God, thank you for everyone online and in this room. Lord, thank you for the opportunities we have that we're going to hear in a moment from Dorothy. God, be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.